Okay, good afternoon. I'm Leslie Maitland, chair of the Amram Scholar Series. And it's my great honor in Rabbi Lustig's absence to welcome you to this season's closing program. I hope you had a chance to enjoy food and drink at our reception, which will resume following our discussion here and our author's book sale and sign-in, in case you missed it before. <coughs> Frankly, uh, the tense and conflicted national political mood that centers on our city this year led us this year to seek out speakers who would boost our spirits. And our scholars today continue in that vein as professors Jeremy Dauber and Michael Krasny have each examined the distinctive nature of Jewish humor and its many wildly successful practitioners whose audiences extend far beyond the Jewish community. So what is Jewish humor? Does it represent a set of themes, a worldview colored by centuries of persecution, a particular cast of vaguely irritating comic characters from the Shlemiel and Shlemazel to the Jewish mother and the Jap and an ironic self-consciousness that has arisen out of otherness, a sense of defiant difference, even as we yearn to assimilate? And then how is Jewish humor changing over time? As the world of Yiddish culture and inflection fades, and so much of our comedy, I think John Stewart, spotlights the ever more ridiculous mayhem inspired by politics. According to the New York Times, Saul Bellow thought Jewish humor combined laughter and trembling, while Mel Brooks similarly suggested, if they're laughing, how can they bludgeon you to death? <laughs> <laughs> These are the sorts of issues that our speakers will discuss today, examining Jewish humor from biblical times to the age of Twitter. Jeremy Dauber, uh, Jeremy Dauber is a professor of Yiddish language, literature, and culture at Columbia University and previously spoke here in 2014 <coughs> about one of his several uh, earlier books, The World of Sholem Alechem, which was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. His latest work, Jewish Comedy, A Serious History, has been hailed as a brilliant and groundbreaking tour of the funny side of some very serious business, and vice versa. Professor Dauber lectures frequently at the 92nd Street Y in New York, and other venues throughout the country. Doubling our good fortune, we have with us Michael Krasny, whose latest book, Let There Be Laughter, A Treasury of Great Jewish Humor and What It All Means, includes a hilarious selection of Jewish humor, pages for which I guarantee your own response will provide an authentic laugh track. A scholar of English and American literature, he's a professor at San Francisco State University who also teaches at Stanford and lectures widely. Beyond that, since 1993, um, he has been the host of Forum with Michael Krasny, a news and public affairs interview program on KQED Radio, which is the NPR affiliate in San Francisco. The most listened to locally produced public radio program in the country. The show can also be heard on Sirius XM, Comcast, iTunes, and across the internet. Dr. Krasny is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards for his broadcast journalism and has been honored for public service more than once by the California State Legislature. We are grateful to the Jewish Book Council for helping us arrange this special dual program and several other lectures that we have enjoyed throughout this year. I'll join you now to listen to our speaker's conversation, and I'll be back afterwards to pose your questions. We'll be passing out cards for you to write them. Lastly, there's a certain seven-letter Yiddish word for people whose cell phones go off, <laughs> <laughs> disrupting public programs. So please take a moment to silence them. It's on with the show. Thank you. Well, let me be the one to welcome everybody here uh, and use my booming broadcaster voice to uh, <laughs> let you know how pleased I am to be here, and thank you for inviting me. I'm especially pleased to be with Jeremy Dauber, whose book I've dutifully read and admired, uh, and 
have found him to be a very affable mensch guy, uh, and we're both uh, very serious in many ways about Jewish humor, but also love the laughs that are provided. And since Leslie Maitland uh, was nice enough uh, to tell me about a joke in my book that she loved and actually put in a request, Jeremy, we're going to step a little bit aside Please. here for a moment of course. and open things up with this. This is a special request. It's like I never did DJing, but you know they used to ask, <laughs> would you play this record or something along those lines? So at your request, I will tell this, and then we've decided we're going to talk, and uh, I'll move into a conversation, uh, which I'm pleased and privileged to do with Jeremy Dauber. The joke will take us back, uh, unfortunately, during the Shoah, and it's during the Second World War, and a young man escapes, and he goes to England, and he's very enterprising and very resourceful, and he makes, are you not hearing me? Okay, put it closer to him. Okay, how's that? Is that better? All right, so he, he escapes uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto, and he makes his way to England, and he is a very enterprising and resourceful young man, and he makes a fortune in England. But he wants to get his father, his old Hasidic father, out of the Warsaw Ghetto. And he steers, steers this daring rescue of the father. They take him out in a helicopter. They bring him into England. He says to his father, Pa, I'm, an, I'm a British citizen now. I want you to think of yourself as an Englishman. It's very important that you think primarily of yourself as an Englishman because this country has given me sanctuary, and I believe now that I am an Englishman. Father nods, takes his father to Bond Street and gets him fitted. Take, all the Hasidic garb is gone. He puts him in a beautiful suit. And then he takes him to the local tonsorial place, and they start cutting his hair. And the old man, the payuses are being cut, and the old man starts sobbing, sobbing, wrenching sobs. He says, Pa, why are you sobbing because you feel like you're losing your Jewish identity? He says, no, I'm sobbing because we lost India. Okay, there's the joke. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's a good joke. It's a good joke. It's really an assimilation joke, as I point out in my book. Yeah. So a quick assimilation joke. So Jeremy has done some really uh, original and thoughtful and in some ways extraordinary research with the Bible and humor. And I didn't know there was so much humor in the book of Esther, I must confess. And he's done also a remarkable job with Yiddish. And I thought we would begin maybe by talking about Yiddish and how Yiddish, I mean, it still plays a preeminent role in Jewish humor, as you might imagine. Just heard a joke not that long ago about uh, a Japanese man who heard from his Jewish friend that his wife was having an affair with a Jewish man. And he said to his wife, I hear you're having an affair with a Jewish man. Is this true? And she, who told you this, Mishigas? She says, all right. <laughs> So it's a lot of Yiddish humor that still pervades and uses Yiddish words, of course, to convey that humor and so forth. But what I'm interested in, actually, I don't want to put my interlocutor role to use here <laughs> no, necessarily. No, right. but I'm interested if we're on the same page about this. Because we were talking a little bit beforehand about Isaac Bashev, a singer whom yeah. we both admire tremendously, and I got the privilege of knowing. I remember I was interviewing him in a situation very like this many years ago, a Nobel Prize winning Yiddish writer, and I said to him, Mr. Singer, very serious and solemn, do you believe in free will? And he said, I have no choice. And it was a, <laughs> it was a terrific response, but it was also something about the chicka boom at the end of that, yeah. you know? Um, you think about all these Jewish comics, uh, you think about Henny Youngman, you know, take my wife, please, or I went to the doctor and the doctor said, uh, you're sick, he said, I'm gonna get another opinion. Okay, you're ugly too, you know? Yeah. Those, that has Yiddish roots, the cadences and everything, don't you think, Jeremy? Well, I think, I think that, that, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, they frequently said about people who spoke Yiddish was that, you know, if Martians came and they, they sort of watched people speaking Yiddish with the sound off, they would think Jews only talked with their hands, right? And, uh, you know, and, and, and that was, that it was, Yiddish must be a, a physical language of gesture. And, of course, that's not true, that there is something about the intonations. There is something about sort of the way in which the grammar works that, becomes very interesting in an American context because in Eastern Europe, this was simply the way that one spoke. One spoke Yiddish, one uh, romanced, and one conducted romances in Yiddish, one mourned one's dead in Yiddish, one wrote el elegies in Yiddish, uh, all sorts of things. But in America, when you crossed the Atlantic and Yiddish became something that, uh, that was left behind, whether it was you were getting your payas cut off in Bond Street or whether you, know, you were trying to work uh, you know, seven days a week down on the Lower East Side, it, it became something different. Uh, and one of the things that it beca became very profoundly was a source of comedy. Uh, and it was in some ways, I think, a little bit, among other things, and we can talk more about this, but in the Borscht Belt of a way of parents revenging themselves on their children. Right? I am now a parent, I'm a parent of young kids, and already I can understand why you might want occasionally to have something at your kid's expense. And 
you know, this was these things where, you know, they would bring their kids, they would bring their kids to these uh, hotels, and they would start telling these wonderful English jokes, and then the punchline would be in Yiddish, and all the adults would laugh, and all the kids would say, we don't quite get it. You know, it's a wonderful example of that. Actually, it comes immediately to mind. You were talking about Martians, and there's that famous joke about this creature that's like eight foot tall in the middle of Bloomingdale's, uh, head up by the chandelier, green skin, scaly green skin, and jewelry, lots of jewelry. And a little old lady looks up and she says, where are you from? It's Mars. Oh, is that why you have green skin? Yes. And you speak English and you're fluent in English? Yes. And you also, you have, uh, you're just so tall. You're, how tall are you? Eight foot two. Are everybody on Mars that tall? Within a few inches, yes, depending on males, females. And all this jewelry you're wearing. Does everybody on Mars wear as much jewelry? Not the Goyim. So you... <laughs> That's the perfect Borscht Belt type of joke that it you're talking about. Work. Exactly right there. Right. Yeah. And it's suspect. Basically, uh, just so you know, this is going to, within, you can take an over-under on this, how long this, until this declines into just both of us just telling jokes right back and forth at each other. I, I think that that's right. There's this kind of sub-theme in American comedy of sort of the hidden Jew, right? I mean, there's the, all those country club jokes, right, where it turns out that, you know, they, they, they want to go into the restricted country club, so they go to Paris, and then they come back, and, you know, they sail through their interview. They change their name from Schwartz to Noir, and they, you know, all of these things, right? And they, they pass through the interview, and the, the, the person says, well, Monsieur Noir, Madame Noir, uh, welcome to the country club. We just have one uh, last question. What religion are you? And they say, well, we're going. Yeah. Right. And or it's the, the same uh, the, thing, the, right? It comes out, and it always comes out in Yiddish. Right? Always comes out, and it's always it's like the convert who becomes a priest. And right. He stands up in the cathedral, and all these very religious Catholics are there, and he says, my fellow Goyim. You know, right. I mean, it's the same right. kind of thing. But you know, you reminded me also, uh, there, there's, a, there's a joke that Jack Carter, I bet a lot of people in this audience remember Jack Carter, uh, old school comedian. We use a little Yiddish now and then, but not that much. But this was his favorite joke. I was involved in the PBS presentation on Jewish humor, and he said, far and away, his favorite Jewish joke, and the Jewish joke goes like this. There's a guy who's trying, his name is Schwartz, he's trying to get in a very exclusive club, and he sees there's a guy, and this is also kind of dated when you think about it, he sees there's a guy named Goldwater in the club, because you remember Barry Goldwater, you know, in your heart you know he's right, and his real name was Goldwasser, so he calls him up and he says, how come I'm not in the club, Schwartz, and you're in the club, Goldwater? And Goldwater says, Mr. Schwartz, let me tell you something, first of all, my name is Goldwater, it's not Goldwasser, not Goldwasser. I am an Episcopalian. My father's an Episcopalian. My grandfather, Oliver Shalom, he was an Episcopalian. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't hide their Jewish identity. Right. You know, that's... And that's one of the things about the difference between the first joke you told and the second. The first joke is about sort of that ease of a similar, that, 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 that Jews can go into a place and they can so easily efface their identity that they can become within the moment of a couple of snips. Uh, you know, someone who cries over losing India. And then on the other hand, there's the, there are all these jokes about the continuity of Jewish identity in America, right? In America or elsewhere in the diaspora, that you can't actually change because ultimately the Oliver Sholem was just going to slip in no matter what you do. Uh, and, and that is one of, those are the poles, I think, that we have to navigate between sort of continuity and change, between the acceptance of other kinds of comedy, other kinds of identity, and the one that we have that's continuous. But I want to ask you, what is your, you have, you have a million of them. What is your favorite Jewish joke? Not this other guy's favorite. What is your favorite? That's always been a tough one. Yeah. Um, but I put at the top of my food chain a joke. And, and let me explain it because a lot of my book is midrashic. This is a joke. I'll say nothing in preface except it can offend some women. Um, and I say that with all due respect and a, and a self-proclaimed feminist. But the joke is that there's a man who's dying and his daughter is at his bedside, dutiful and devoted daughter, and suddenly he smells kugel. And he says, and he can barely even speak, he says, I smell kugel. The daughter says, yes, dad, mom is making a kugel. He says, you know, to taste your mother's kugel once before I die. I understand, daddy. And she runs on into the kitchen. And she's gone quite a while. And me, me, he's hanging on, you know, by gossamer threads. Finally, she comes down back. She just sits, folds her hands and says nothing. He goes, where's the kugel? She says, mom says it's for after. <laughs> okay. yeah. The, the, the other version of, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. It sounds like a mean joke, uh, yeah. and it is in many ways. Yeah. The other version of it is, mom says it's for the shiva. Right. But 
the reality of that joke actually has a lot of roots to it because, as Jeremy can tell you, the shtetl was a place where women had to be very practical because many of their husbands were luf mentioned. You know, they were studying Talmud or Torah. They were not going out and making a living or putting food on the table. And the result of that is that women had to be very practical. And this is a joke that talks about the practicality of women. Just like man dies, she calls up the local newspaper. My husband died, I want to put in an obituary. We got to pay by the word. Uh, Mort died, Volvo for sale. All right, so this is very <laughs> practical. It's very practical, man. But I do have, my friend Julian Greenspun's here uh, with um, his fiance. I still can't figure out why she would even be attracted to him, but uh, this is a guy I grew up in Cleveland with. So he's asking me about favorite jokes, and I said, do you know the towel joke? Do any of you know this joke? This has got to be one of my favorite jokes, too. All right. So this couple, it's a much older man. A lot of these jokes are set up like you know, Jeremy, with a much older man and a younger woman, and they get married. And he goes to the rabbi because nothing's happening in the bedroom. It's like the Dead Sea, as they used to say. And the rabbi, who has a remarkable ability to give people uh, connubial and nuptial advice and so forth. The rabbi listens to the whole story. He says, listen, I'm going to propose something that's going to sound really off the wall, crazy, but just try it. You have nothing to lose. He says, there's a handsome young congregant. His name is Paul. I'm going to send him to your house at 5 o'clock tonight, and you two be in bed, and he's going to stand there, and he's going to be completely buck naked, and he's just going to wave a towel in front of himself, and maybe that will arouse your wife. Yeah. He says, we'll try it. We'll try anything, rabbi. Thank you. All right, so they go back a day later. The rabbi says, what happened? Well, Paul came in, he waved the towel, and nothing happened. It was for garnished, you know. So the rabbi said, all right, I'm going to suggest something much more transgressive, much more daring and bold. Paul's going to come tonight. You start off waving the towel and let Paul make love to your wife. <laughs> so the older guy's come out reluctant, but he's desperate. He says, whatever works, if you think this works, rabbi, if you're pragmatist about it, fine, let's do it. So sure enough, they come back uh, to the house. It's about 5 o'clock. Paul comes in. He gets the towel. The husband gets the towel. Paul gets in bed with his wife and starts making love to her. And she's clearly in ecstasy. She's yelling and screaming and all kinds of things like that. He's waving the towel, the husband. And he goes over to Paul and says, that's how you wave a towel. <laughs> I think the Torah scrolls were blushing, I think. It's a, that's it. And your favorite joke? You know, I don't, I mean, uh, as you say, sort of some of the favorite jokes are kind of nasty, so I'm not sure that, uh, you know. But, um, you know, I, I think, let's see, is this a, is, people seem to like the nasty jokes, right? Should we, should we, should we, all right, so, so this, joke, uh, this joke is told as uh, these two old men sitting on a park bench in Tel Aviv. How many, anyone know this joke? So one of them, they, they look at each other, one sits down, they look at each other, Ruben, is that you? Shimon? It's you. Huh? How are you doing? It's been such a long time. Well, it's, yeah, no, it's been forever. Well, how are your parents? Catch me up. How are your parents? How are they? Ruben, we're, we're old men. Our parents passed a long time ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. How, how's, your, how's your sister? You know, I have to tell you, I really always liked your sister. You know, if things had been a little different, maybe. We, oh, I guess you didn't hear, you know. Fifteen years ago, she passed cancer. The guys, oh, I'm sorry to, to hear that. Well, how about your brother? Well, I guess we really have not been in touch. My brother died ten years ago. He had a stroke. Oh, well, how's your wife? I, I, I'm sorry to do this to you, but, but you know, five years ago, she died in the bus bombing. And the guy is totally, he's lost it now. And he says, well, you know, well, your kids, how are your kids doing? The guy goes, you'll laugh, but they're dead too. I told you it was nasty. You'll laugh. You'll laugh, but they're dead too. Right? Very nasty, right? And that is the thing about Jewish comedy, is that if you can take that kind of trauma and you can preface the words, you'll laugh before it, that in some ways is the essence of what a lot of Jewish comedy has been, is trying to take the most remarkable series of traumatic events that have taken place in Jewish history and have somehow tried to put a comic spin on them, and understanding that that is insufficient, that it fails, that it teeters between comedy and anxiety, that is the essence of what Jewish comedy is. So you're the biblical scholar. Is there humor in Job? 
So <laughs> this is a good question. The, the Job is, and there have been a number of scholars who have suggested this, Job is technically speaking, in the technical sense of the phrase, a comedy, right? In the sense that Job loses things, he goes through travails, but then at the end, if you remember the end of it, because he does not curse God and die, he is given, he is vouchsafed more than what he has before. To take the title of another comedy from later on, all's well that ends well. But the question is whether or not the ending can ever possibly merit or justify the suffering that he goes through. Fine, Job has new children, but could that justify the suffering of losing his first ones? And again, that is, I think, the question of Jewish history that comedy tries to answer. The Jewish comedy very, very frequently tries to answer. Now, in my book, I say that's not the only question, but that is, I think, one of the most promising ones, right? Or to put it another way, sometimes I say in lectures, you know, this is the greatest Jewish joke ever told. And everyone is always disappointed. I'm going to warn you in advance. This is disappointing. Right? And the Jewish joke takes place at the end of the Bible, where it says, after the destruction of the temple, right? Jews say something like this. You, Goyim, you think that just because you have destroyed our temple, you've killed our leadership, you've scattered us among the nations, you've ruined our political autonomy, you guys think you're in charge? What schmucks you are? We're the chosen people. <laughs> right? Black comedy, I think, at its very finest. But that is what has developed Jewish humor, I think, to its sharpest and keenest edge. It's and funny, it, that word, yeah. bla that phrase black comedy came associated with a lot of American writers who I've taught through the years, Bruce J. Yeah. Friedman, of right. course, Nathaniel West even, going back. But it's, uh, it's also a kind of gallows humor that you're talking about that really is implicit in a great deal of Jewish humor. Yeah. And when you're talking about... Um, <laughs> Uh, just well, you, you set up a whole bunch of different stuff. Sure, we were talking before we sat down, though, about I'm going to give you a plug with your, his next book, uh, Jeremy's next book. He told me is about comic books. So I mentioned Michael Chabon, an, an author. Some of you know Cavalier and Clay, and um, and I came up with a theory. And I'm just let me bounce this off yeah, you and th see if it makes sense to you. And it's in my book. Um, I was at Esalen Institute. <laughs> which has a lot of Jewish humor attached to it, which I won't get, <laughs> hot tubs and all the rest of that sort of stuff. But suddenly I had this revelation. I believe it or not, I was teaching Jewish humor at Esalen Institute. And uh, saying, you know, this is, my, Michael writes, Michael Chabon writes about um, the golem, the whole golem story. And I thought, yeah. the golem is really Jewish humor. I mean, you use what you make out of your imagination uh -huh. as offense and defense to be combative and also to go up against your enemies and to also protect yourself against suffering, really. It really seemed to me to make sense. But here's another question that's attached to that. Yeah. So much of this humor that we're talking about is really Ashkenazi humor, isn't yeah. it, really? Primarily, in fact. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Uh, and I think, I think that what's interesting about sort of non-Ashkenazi Jewish humor um, is that the, the, perhaps the most influential uh, kind of Sephardic Jewish humor was the humor of the Golden Age of Spain, which was very kind of witty. It was this poetry that sort of drew from sort of the cosmopolitan Arabic models around it. It relied on this incredibly kind of sophisticated uh, usage of biblical and rabbinic texts. It was, it was just a remarkable thing. And, and what it said in some ways, and I think this was part of the Sephardic culture and then became part of the Ashkenazic culture, was that words were the most important currency of, of, of humor, right? That in some sense, wit, to be witty, and that was what you were saying before about always having that response, right, is, is sort of the wittiness. And in some ways, this is related to the golem as well, because, and I wanted to, I'm glad that we're talking about this because it can, we can leave you with some uh, practical advice uh, coming out, which is how to stop a rampaging golem, right? Everybody knows this? Does anyone know how, if, you, if you've built the golem and it gets out of control, does people know how to, to do this, right? So what you do is the golem has, according to Jewish lore, has the word emet, the Hebrew word, right, emet, written on its forehead, which means truth, right? So what you do is you go and you erase the olive off the golem's head. Um, the lore is not clear on how you get to the forehead of the rampaging golem. But if you can, release it, and then it's left with the word met, which means dead. So the golem, reading its own forehead, says, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be dead, and dies. So the importance of words is so central. Right? First of all, I think this must be a joke, right? But the importance of words are so central to this that uh, what you end up having 
is uh, a tradition in which that kind of verbal and textual facility is central to self-understanding, and humor is all about that. Now, you have some wonderful things in your book about the plays on words, and I was reminded, in fact, of... Um... <laughs> sure. Is that better? Can people hear me better? Yeah. Okay. Before my book went to press, I heard a couple of jokes that were not in the book, and yes. I thought, you know, how could there be jokes? That I had? <laughs> um, and one of them was this joke about, some of you may know this, about uh, a man who um, dies and his brother goes to see the rabbi. And he says to the rabbi, um, I want you to, I know you have a capital campaign. I'm willing to donate a million dollars if you just say at my brother's funeral that he was a mensch. And the rabbi goes home and he's really in agony and tells his wife, this man was a terrible man. He was terrible to his employees. He was terrible to his neighbors, even his family. How can I say he was a mensch? His wife says, sweetie, you're going to have to work that out for yourself. I don't know what to tell you. He goes in front of the congregation the next day at the funeral, and he says, I have to be honest with you, all of you. He says, this was not a nice man. This was not a kind man. Uh, but compared to his brother, he was a mensch. <laughs> There's so many Jewish jokes that really evolve that way or move that way toward... Just the use of the word mensch again or something like that. By the way, the other joke that I hadn't heard and some of you may, is a lot of, shall we say, older people here, my demographic. Um, there's, a, um, there's another joke about a rabbi who was giving a sermon and at the end of the sermon, he went up to a young man in the audience and he said, forgive me, I don't want to be invasive or anything, but you look troubled and I'm a rabbi, I'm a teacher and I like to think of myself as someone who wants to be empathizing and helping people. Can you tell me, is there something on your mind? He said, Rabbi, you're absolutely right. I'm really disturbed about something. He said, I meet women online in these dating services, and I bring them home, and every single one of them my mother doesn't like. He said, I've fallen in love with a few, and I really wanted to marry a few, but my mother doesn't like them. What am I going to do? The rabbi says, look, I've got a solution for you. You go online, and you find someone who has a lot in common with your mother. Did that ever occur to you? You know, in these dating services, you can find someone who meets all kinds of profiles. He said, Rabbi, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you, Kanahora. All right. Turns up a couple weeks later, he looks even more lugubrious, sadder than he did the first time. The rabbi can't wait to find out what happened. Goes out to him, he says, what happened? He said, I took your advice, Rabbi. I found a young woman, and she not only had all these interests in common with my mother, she talked like my mother. She cooked like my mother. She even looked like my mother. Rabbi said, well, what was the problem? My father hated her, so there he is. Okay. Right. They, why do married people like that joke? Right. Tell me. Okay. Yeah. So. I, it's a great joke. Right? I think it's a, and it, it's a wonderful sign of the way that these jokes, which structurally, you know, they, they have, they could be told almost at any time or place. They, they evolve, right? I mean, this joke could have been told without the internet component. Um, but now we tell them the 21st century, right? I mean, and, 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 you know, the online dating part of it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, you know, I think that, uh, there, you know, the 50s were a golden age of rabbi jokes, and there's so many about the golf-playing rabbis, and, the, you know, the one about the rabbi who plays golf on Yom Kippur, right? It's, uh, wait, people know this one, right? The way the rabbi goes, and he goes out on Yom Kippur, he says, you know, I have been doing this every year for 25 years. Today, screw it, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go play golf. Right? And so he goes out the links. Nobody's there, right? It's Jim Kipper, right? He goes out. He hits the first one, hole in one. Second tee, hole in one. Third tee, all, all through the 18 hole, right? And up in heaven, right, the angels approach God, and they say, you know, God, how can this be? A rabbi d d abandoning his congregation, disrespecting the holiest day of the year in order to play golf, and you reward him with the best golf game in the history of golf games? And God smiles and strokes his beard and says, yeah, but who's he going to tell? <laughs> right? Yeah. And there are some wonderful Yom Kippur jokes. Uh, I, I grew up in Cleveland. They used to call it Yom Kippur. I thought it was a fish holiday. But um, I'm reminded also uh, of, a, of a question that's sort of, um, we've got all this uh, stuff with microphones. Yeah. See how that sounds, Jeremy. Yeah. Can everyone hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I was just reflecting on something I'd like to hear your thoughts about, and that is, because uh, I spent some time on my book on this, and it's always been something I muse about a lot, how a lot of these Jewish jokes, without the Yiddish, obviously, or the kinds of things we're talking about, translate into other cultures. I yeah. mean, they're, um, you know, Ruth Weiss from Harvard did a whole right. book on this, and um, I mean, there's, 
there's some jokes that are distinctively Jewish, you know, and there's no way of uh, making them into anything else. You know, the famous one about a little <laughs> physicist in England who is knighted by the queen and he has a yarmulke on and she says, why is this knight different than all other knights? I mean, you don't right. get that in any other culture really, right? Really, right? Um, there are those kind of jokes, but so many of these jokes just cross over different cultures and become almost right. universal. Really. Right. That's that. No, that is that is true. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Ruth, who is my teacher, uh, um, you know, often tells the story of a young woman uh, who takes one who took one of her classes and says, "I don't understand how Fiddler on the Roof uh, was in Yiddish because it really is Japanese, right?" And you have these sort of these things go on and on, um, and I think that it's because. Nobody ever, you know, you, you sometimes, I'm sure this is the case with you, sometimes you get these people come and say, well, what's unique about Jewish humor? Mm. Right? When Ruth and, Weiss was on, we got a lot of those kind of things here. Yeah, yeah, and my, you know, my answer is almost always, not very much. That is to say, the particular circumstances that give rise to it are unique, right? So it's like there's that joke, right, where you say, well, there was this rabbi and his friend, and the person stops the guy who's telling the joke, and he says, you know, why is it always there's a rabbi and a friend, there's a rabbi and a friend, I hate it, it's so anti-Semitic, rabbi, why can't you make it just about two businessmen? He goes, okay, so two businessmen go to officiate a bar mitzvah, <laughs> right? And so sometimes they have to be, and they're about particular Jewish moments, they're about particular Jewish historical sensibilities. But a lot of times, if they're about the experience of suffering persecution, Right, if they're about the idea of being an outsider, if they're about the idea, they can be about a, a lot of different groups have had similar experiences, and they, it's not surprising that similar kinds of comedy have developed uh, as a result. You've also brought up an, an interesting question that I often hear uh, when I give talks on Jewish humor, and that is some of this humor almost does sound anti Semitic. Yeah. And should we be concerned, and should we tell these kind of stories, because they're wonderful stories for Jews to hear maybe and enjoy? But to mixed, uh, they don't use the word ecumenical anymore, but you know, mixed crowds in terms of religious backgrounds and so forth. And they make a lot of Jews, especially I think more devout Jews, more and more uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that, and I think that this is a question that increasingly uh, became prominent in the 20th and now the 21st century um, as communities become more heterogeneous between Jews and non Jews. Uh, for most of Jewish history, this concern would have been a very marginal concern because if you were telling a joke to someone, there wouldn't have been mixed company. You would have been told, telling it uh, in a Jewish community among Jews. Right? This becomes a product of sort of the last 50 or 60 years where people are uh, producing this comedy uh, and, produce, and telling these jokes for a wider audience. Now, this had a lot of positive resonances as well. People like Henny Young, a lot of the Borscht Belt comics, um, they are coming out and they are presenting an image of Jews in America to a much wider audience who are saying, oh, these, you know, Jews are in many ways very similar to us, and we can, uh, you know, therefore we can accept them into our households we, on our small screens, and then subsequently for a certain kind of social acceptance. There's, um, but I think, uh, you know, there are other communities uh, they, where, where it comes with that. I should say is that there are jokes that uh, would have been would have been perfectly comfortable uh, for people to tell all the time, and, and the norms have changed as a result because the audiences have. Something that I think has changed in a quantum way, and yeah. I write about it, and it's been a trajectory that I noticed, um, is the jokes that used to be, especially after the Shoah, considered absolutely almost taboo or verboten. You don't tell jokes about Jews being cheap or Jews being concerned about money. These change. A lot of younger comics particularly go out there and they make fun of themselves as Jews, therefore make fun of the cheapness or the money mania or whatever you want to call it. And there's been more of an acceptance strangely enough, among Jews themselves of this, um, almost a kind of chauvinism about it. Let me give you an example. I want to read this from my book, if I may, because I went through a lot of trouble trying to make this narrative just right uh, and sound just right. And this is a pretty funny joke, I think. I, you should never preface a joke by saying that, but it's a pretty funny joke. Um, and, I, and I wanted to exemplify something in the language that I used in the narrative, because jokes are really narratives. You know? Two Texans are sitting on a plane going to Dallas with an old Jewish man sitting between them. First Texan says, my name is Roger. I own 250,000 acres. I have 1,000 head of cattle, and they call my place the Jolly Roger. Second Texan says, my name is John. I own 350,000 acres. I have 5,000 head of cattle, and they call my place Big John's. They both look down at the little old Jewish man who says, my name is Lenny Leibowitz, and I own only 300 acres. Roger looks down at him and says, 300 acres, what do you raise? Nothing, says Lenny. Well, then what do you call it, asks John. Downtown Dallas. Okay. 
I see. You love that joke, right? It's a, it's a great joke. But things have changed. There was a time when that joke was really, in many ways, absolutely verboten because you're saying Jews own part of Dallas, Jews are controlling, they have too much money, and so forth, after the Shoah. Well, I think that this gets to a, you know, a whole uh, long history of, of, of jokes which are about sort of Jewish intellectually one-upping the Gentile sort of neighbor. So, for example, there's another joke about a Texan sitting next to a Jew on an airplane, right? I mean, I'm sure you know this one as well, right, where the Texan says, you know, I got to tell you how big my ranch is. Right? I got to tell you, I get in my car in the morning, and I drive, and I drive, and I drive, and I drive, and by the time the evening comes, I have not gotten to the end of my property. And the Jew says, yeah, Nebuch, I had a car like that too. <laughs> and I think that... I think that the idea, um, you know, is, right, uh, the idea is that for a long time, I mean a long time over centuries, you could not tell that kind of joke if you were a Jew because the Gentile would kill you, right? That would be the next step. And so America provides, and, and as I say this in my book, Lenny Bruce is a big sort of, uh, he takes a big step in this direction because he stands in front of mixed company and he says, he makes a joke. He's like, you know, Jesus, yes, we killed him. You know why we killed him? He didn't want to be a doctor. That's why we killed him. <laughs> and there is that sense of just saying, I can say this to Gentiles, and nobody is going to do anything, but there's not going to be a pogrom. That is a big, big difference. But on the other hand, you know, um, it, it again makes people uncomfortable, like you're saying, like you were saying before, Michael. And that's the reason why somebody like Larry David has made so many people uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, because he keeps pushing the envelope. You reminded me, in fact, of uh, that. Of, uh, how do you know Curb Your Enthusiasm? You know, when they started, uh, Cheryl, his yeah, Gentile you wife. Yeah, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. They, had a, they had a manger scene, and, you know, he wound up eating them. He thought they were cookies, you know. Um, I mean, think about just something like that being put out into popular entertainment on, so, on any kind of level. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it would have been unthinkable. I always look at Woody Allen in this sense. I know he's not that popular among many people now. He used to be, at one point, believe it or not, a sex symbol. I don't know what's happened, but, you know. Um, he, um, he was coming up with jokes like, oh, you like this beautiful pocket watch of mine? Yeah, it means a lot to me. My grandfather sold it to me on his deathbed. And so those kinds of things, at one time, were absolutely not acceptable. But then the envelope started to be pushed, even to the point where who would have thought there would be Showa humor. Who would have thought there would be post-Holocaust humor? When the Mel Brooks came out with the producers, it really, and you write about this too in your book, it really broke all kinds of lines that had existed and became more and more as time went on until you got to Larry David, you know, and he's, he's got a friend of his father's, play, his father played by Shelley Berman, and the friend of his father's is Sally, who's a survivor of Auschwitz, and he brings the guy Donaldson from the TV show Survivor, and they're comparing notes, you know, about who had it worse. This is unthinkable stuff. I mean, it's just really almost radioactive at one time, and now they just keep pushing it. Yeah. Got to the point where, and a lot of people were bothered by this, uh, interested to hear what you have to say about it, Jeremy, where da Larry David, through all these Me Too people, were being exposed from Harvey Weinstein and others yeah. as being Jews. He gets up there on Saturday Night Live, and he starts talking about, you know, starts talking about it in an open way. He didn't used to do those kinds of things because it was bad for the Jews. Well, I think it's very interesting. I mean, the, this, you know, there was, as you say, this Larry David uh, opening monologue on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Um, almost all of the press about it came about the second part of his monologue, which was basically a George Costanza in Auschwitz kind of thing, where he, he does this sort of joke, which I wrote about in The Atlantic, and I said I didn't think it was a very good joke. I didn't think it sort of did what it was supposed to do and, and was problematic as a result. But, what you were, but the first part is nobody talked about, it, and that was the part that you focused in on, which was to say that he says, look, I felt very uncomfortable with all, why do they have to mention that all these sexual predators are Jews, right? And, and of course, they weren't. Not all of them were. Uh, and, and it, you know, but this, this where's idea... Jonas Salk and where's, you know, all these Jewish heroes? Right, Hank right. This is who I like to think about, right? Yeah. And this idea that Larry David is putting himself as a representative Jew is very interesting because, first, as you were pointing out on Curb Your Enthusiasm, he does this in a very interesting way, which is as an object of classic anti-Semitic hatred, right? I mean, as you said, he ruins, a, you know, he eats Jesus. He eats these Jesus cookies, right? This is the old anti-Semitic trope that the Jews would eat sort of the host. Um, he literally urinates on a picture of Jesus, 
right, in one of the episodes. That actually caused some backlash. He does all of these different things. Um, and of course, the reason that he could do this was to use a, a, a slogan from popular culture, it's not TV, it's HBO, right? That when he was co-creating Seinfeld, there was, even in the 80s and the 90s, there was a great deal of anxiety about the kind of material, perhaps, that Larry David would want to put on, and he was just simply not able to do it. But moving to HBO, uh, he was able to, do, uh, to, to break taboo ground a lot more, and over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, people ranging from the women of Broad City to the characters on Transparent to many others have been able to constantly, as you were saying before, sort of move this line to push it sort of more in this direction. I talk about a little bit about this in the book. But, yeah. Yeah. It gets to the point, though, sometimes where, and I know we've got a certain demographic here tonight. I mean, how many of you honestly sometimes feel uncomfortable when you hear some of the kind of humor we're talking about here or have seen it uh, in one form or another? It gives you a feeling, I mean, especially given the fact, I mean, when we were growing up, everything was it's bad for the Jews, you know? Uh, and the concern was there would be a shanda, you know, that there would be a scandal, in other words, because somebody's going to reflect on all of us, some bad Jew like Jack Ruby or, you know, whomever it might be even. I think things change maybe with Monica Lewinsky. But anyway, there was a point where if it's bad for the Jews or if it looks bad for the Jews, if it gives us a kind of black eye, we all have to take it and we all have to internalize it in a collective identity way. Yeah, and all I would say is that, you know, the history of American Jewish comedy is this is an ever-present panic. In the 19-teens, I think, or the early 1920s, Milt Gross, right, the great cartoonist and comedian, right, produced a, a parody of... Um, the, night, the, the poem, The Night Before Christmas, which in, in Jewish dialect form, and I think it was something called something, The Night That Was In Front Of The Christmas, or something like that, I don't quite remember. Uh, and this, was a hu this became a huge moral pen, right? And then when Philip Roth produces Goodbye Columbus, right, um, which is a wonderful work of great American Jewish comedy, it's a work of satire, among many other things, a work of great literature, this becomes, right? Uh, there is a constant drumbeat, and then the producers comes out, and of course, as you say, there has never been a period in American Jewish culture that has not been suffused with anxiety about American Jewish presentation towards the larger majority. That's not to say that this period might not be worse, right? It's not, that's not my point. My point is that we're always engaged in this question, and simply knowing that it is a permanent question may do something with our perspective on, on looking at these phenomena. And I think Roth, uh, since you mentioned him, yeah. uh, I mean, Portnoy's complaint was a major bestseller. Yeah. And here he comes out with this little theorem. Those of you who know your Freud, you know, he said, I want to put the id in yid, and I want to put the oi in goi. Yeah. And that was, you know, the delineation that many people thought, you know, this is, this is terrible. What's he saying here? Well, he's saying that we need Jews to be more animalistic and less guilt-ridden and all the rest of that sort of thing put the oi in the, in, in the goy, let the Gentiles have all this suffering and guilt and so forth. My people, Portnoy says, take your suffering and you know, put it where the sun don't shine, as they used to say. So I thought that was really a breakthrough novel. It was also a breakthrough novel in the sense that he was so upfront about all of this um, uh, excessive sexuality and identifying it with, 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 with Jewish males, even to the point where he talked about Remember, Hitler used to have these kind of Heides, you know, up in the Alps and everything, and Jewish guys were predatory, and they were looking at them and drooling and wanting, you know, to essentially seduce them. And uh, here's Roth writing about shikses and saying, yeah, I'm hungry for, I lust after shikses. This is what I want. And it was, at one time, the, the, the Jews' worst possible nightmare, that somebody could put that in print, put that in a language, and put it out there for Gentile consumption. And, you know, one of the remarkable... But it was funny. And it was funny. And it was, as you said, it was a huge, it was a huge success. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that is sort of the most prominent about it, you know, apropos of our conversation, is that constantly in Portnoy's complaint, he's name-checking, you know, Jewish comedy. He talks about Henny Youngman that you had mentioned before in the book. He says, ultimately, and I think this is one of the keys to reading that novel, he says, you know, you know I'm living, my life is a Jewish joke, only it's not a joke. Right. right, that's sort of his, that, that is the complaint that Alexander Portnoy sort of finds himself in. And this, I think, is a question for a lot of American Jews, sort of at that period, maybe even, right, is how do we escape the trap that American Jewish culture, which in many ways has been a culture suffused with Jewish comedy, has put us in, in terms of defining us, right? How can a Jewish mother be a Jewish mother and not a Jewish mother? Right? How can a Jewish man be a Jewish man? Not a Jewish man? This is an interesting thing. When, if you look at the recent Pew studies of American Jewish identity, they say one of them. They say I think this is the case that the most important aspect. 
if you say what percentage of people say this is important to a Jewish identity, the highest number is a sense of humor, right? Which, just to say what it's not, right? It's not observing Jewish commandment, whatever that might mean. It's not knowing Jewish history, right? Whatever that is. It's not Zionism. It's having a sense of humor, right? Again, my only point is to say that this is not what almost any other Jewish community in history would have said. Even though they had, as I say in my book, great senses of Jewish humor. Right, and it was specifically Jewish comedy. We Again, talk about the, maybe the difference between Judaism and Jewishness, which is a Roth distinction, Philip Roth yeah. distinction. I think it's a good, useful one, yeah. a viable one in many ways. Um, Jewish identity, uh, we're getting into some pretty serious stuff here, but I want to... <laughs> It's serious to, business. That's well, it is serious about. business. Um, and, you know, whenever sometimes you talk about comedy in theoretical ways and all that, yeah. you get down to sometimes losing uh, for the academic purposes and intellectual purposes. And I, don't, I hope we're not doing that because there's so much to savor here and so much richness to this humor. And I keep thinking about not only the jokes but the folklore. And you do wonderful things with folklore in your book. Um, and, and even the biblical stories, there's just a range and, 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 and an unbelievable range of humor. I actually went to the trouble in my book of identifying just names of leading Jewish humorists, either stand-up comics or so forth. But this book could have been an elegy in some ways. It wasn't. It was a book I wanted people to enjoy and, and, and find humorous and laugh at. Um, but a lot of that Borscht Belt humor, a lot of that Yiddishkeit humor and everything has passed on. I mean, it's moved into... Uh, being eclipsed by secularism and by uh, a lot of kids identify with Jewishness. They identify with, you know, Jewish food and Jewish humor, and they think Sarah Silverman's very funny and um, some of the more contemporary humorous, Chelsea Handler, only half Jewish, but that's all right. Amy Schumer, only half Jewish, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> why have we seen this evolve in ways that have eclipsed a lot of the richness? Because of assimilation. And so many of these jokes that we tell and so much of the humor has to do with exactly that. You know, here we're sitting in a synagogue. Some of you probably know this joke. It's a classic joke. But it's a joke that I take very seriously in many ways. So a young man goes into an Orthodox shul and he sees the rabbi in the shul and he says, Rabbi, I'd like you to say a bracha over my Mercedes. And the rabbi looks at him and he says, are you kidding me? I'm, I'm, I'm from, I'm Orthodox. I don't know any brachas over Mercedes. Go see the conservative rabbi. Maybe he can help you. He's only down a block in the left. He goes to the conservative rabbi and says, I was sent here by the Orthodox rabbi. I want a bracha said over my Mercedes. Can you say a bracha over my Mercedes? And the conservative rabbi says, I'm sorry. I don't know any brachas over cars, and this is a German car. And I, You should see the reform rabbi. So he goes down to the reform rabbi, and he says to the reform rabbi, can you say a bracha over my Mercedes? And the reform rabbi says, what kind of Mercedes? He says, it's a 350 SL. He says, oh, yeah, you should get pretty good mileage on it. He says, well, by the way, what's a bracha? Uh, <laughs> it's a painful joke in many ways, let's face it, because you say, you know, this, he wants a blessing and he wants a bracha, and yet none of the, it's only the reform rabbi. Let me give you another example of what I'm talking about here. All right. Just f for quick... Uh, elucidation and enlightenment said. I, again, I want to give this, I'm not trying to hype, believe me, I'm not trying to hype my book here. He says demurely. Um, this is, all right, we're in a temple, so all due respect to the temple we're in. But here's another one of those kind of jokes. Three modern rabbis are arguing about which of the three is most progressive. I am definitely the most progressive, says the first rabbi. We allow smoking during services. That's nothing, replies the second rabbi. We serve pork sparrows during Yom Kippur. <laughs> Not bad, replies the third rabbi. But I have you all beat. During Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we post signs at my temple. Close for the holidays. <laughs> but those jokes are about a waning sense of Judaism, and they're very serious jokes in many ways, and they're troubling jokes. Because the first joke I told you about, the bracha is saying, my car and materialism and everything, that has sort of supplanted the idea of what the religion really represents and what a bracha really represents. And it's lost in some respects. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of those jokes really are telling us painful things, but they're making fun of them and they're kind of finding humor in them. Yeah, I know. I mean, and, and as you're saying, I mean, this is, you know, many of these jokes, uh, the, 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 uh, those jokes that you told sort of come from sort of the middle of the 20th century, right? There's one from a couple of decades earlier, right, uh, where, you know, the son who has come over on Ellis Island, you know, 20 years before, he finally makes enough money to bring over his mother, 
and you know his mother meets him on the boat, right? And 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 he says, you know, Mama, Mama, it's so good to see you. And she almost can't recognize him. She says, Son, where's your beard? And he says, Oh, it's America. Nobody, everyone shaves in America. And he says, Well, you know, uh, she says, But you keep Shabbos says, with the factories. They have to go seven days a week. You, you can't you can't keep Shabbos here anymore. And he says, well, but you must keep kosher. Says, kosher meat, it's so expensive. It's very, just very difficult to do. People don't do it here anymore. We don't do it. And she lowers her voice and she looks. She goes, are you still circumcised? <laughs> 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 right? I mean, so, you know, and I, I feel like in, you know, in 50, you know, in, in years, it's past, we're going we're gonna to all meet up again. Anyway, we, you know, we're going to be telling sort of these jokes about sort of the internet model of this. That is, Jewish culture, you look at it as sort of over the grand panorama, which I try and do in my book, there are constantly circumstances of acculturation and the worries about decline. Even all the way back, uh, uh, Michael was talking about the Book of Esther. The Book of Esther is a story about people who are so acculturated, their names Mordechai and Esther are named after divin foreign divinities, after all, and whose Esther's Jewishness, right, and her triumphant Jewishness, comes and adheres almost entirely simply in her stating, in, at, in a forum of the highest stakes, I am Jewish. I am a Jew. That's what her Jewishness consists of. Nothing less, but not much more. And so all my only point is, these are very old questions. And so we're lucky we have thousands of years of comedy that are produced by them along the way. But you know, when you mention the internet and all the changes that have gone on with technology, yeah. one of the things I was hyper aware of in writing this book is now you go online and read a lot of these jokes. And so what we're losing, and this again, a lot of Jewish humor is about loss and reflects loss because it's a major value and theme in Jewish identity, I would argue. And one of the things that you realize is that the jokes are a click away, a lot of these jokes now. And so what's happened to telling jokes? And what's happened to, I mean, this is a concern of mine because I really obviously like to tell jokes and I like to hear them. And uh, you have to ask yourselves to some degree, what's happening to that old type of humor that really relied upon the joke? I recently had the uh, fun of interviewing John Cleese of Monty Python on my radio program. And he said to me, I can't go and tell jokes anymore on campuses because everything's too PC. It's too mm -hmm. politically correct. And I've heard people like Chris Rock say this, and I've heard others you know, who are major comedians say they can't go on campus anymore. I mean, it's, it's ironic that things have opened up more in terms of Jewish stereotypes and ridiculing them and making fun of them and parodying them. But in terms of a lot of the humor that is too sensitive for, let's say, some of our college kids and our undergraduates, you can't do those. And, and jokes, jokes are something almost of the past, not entirely. People still love to hear a good joke and tell good jokes. But all those comics who told jokes, you don't find that kind of humor anymore. They were identified mainly with Jewish stand-up comics. I think that you're absolutely right that a lot of the energy of Jewish comedy in the mid-century, in the, in the decades where American Jewish humor dominated American humor was in the stand-up world. And I think that yeah. came out because there were a lot of very powerful national forums for telling those things, whether they were the variety shows on television and people would come out, right, or they would be Las Vegas or the Borscht Belt or whatever. Uh, and now I think that there are many people who are producing wonderful work in very different kinds of medium, which is not to say that it's not Jewish comedy, right, but people who are doing sketch comedy, uh, people who are doing, um, you know, television shows, which, and when I say television, I mean that are streaming on an internet connection near you, right? All of these things, and, and we're, we're seeing sort of a wide variety of kind of media for these things, and, and, and the comedy is flowing in those directions. Um, they're not necessarily the ones that we uh, like the most uh, or, or, or the most familiar with, but I, I, I think one of the interesting things is that they are developing in a lot of these different directions uh, in the same way that, um, you know, it required radio and television and the variety stage and what have you for, for a certain kind of American Jewish comedy uh, of the kind we love to flourish as well. Well, one of the motifs I work with is the difference between Jack Benny, yeah. who was one of the most popular sitcom shows of all time, and Seinfeld. Because yeah. Benny was never, I mean, he was acting cheap all the time and using that as humor and a lot, everybody, we all knew he was Jewish and there was a kind of secret thing to decode in that, but he right. never was outly in any way out as a Jew, never. Uh, and Seinfeld was out there, but again, it was a lot of it was ridicule. A lot of it was making fun of moils and rabbis and, and whatnot, and there's a real distinction, I think, that needs to be made there. One of the things I miss about John Stewart, and I do miss John Stewart a lot, was he sometimes infused his work with more traditional kind of Jewish humor. Any of you see that great bit he did about 
the difference between Passover and Easter. Uh, John Stewart, go, look it up on YouTube. It's really worth looking up. He gets up there and he, say, he, say, for, he first starts out with the Yiddish word. He says, mishpocha, you know, <laughs> means Jewish relatives, right? Kin, I'm talking to you directly. We've got to get our game up for the sake of our kids. He said, look, here's an Easter basket. Look what it has in it, chocolate bunnies and, and jelly beans. I mean, look at a Passover plate. You've got a dead lamb. You've got horseradish. You know, <laughs> I mean, and, and, and he could use himself for this humor in ways that was really very enterprising and, and funny in the old traditional sense. He said, my wife's Catholic and I'm Jewish. We're raising our kids to be sad. You know, <laughs> it's a great line. But like Jeremy says, there have to be different kind of venues and what those venues are going to be, particularly with all this technology. A lot of it will wait to see, but we've opened the Pandora's box. We don't know what we're getting with this technology. I'll put on my little homily hat for a moment because Look at what's happened with technology. This is a very serious issue to me. I don't know what's happening to the neural pathways of our children. They're looking at their devices all the time. I'm getting a little bit too didactic here. But you really think about it, and you realize that we've passed over into another era. We've passed over into another epoch. And I don't know where it's all going. I remember talking to all these people from Facebook, and they were all so kumbaya and the connectivity and we're connecting the world and we're doing all these wonderful things and everything. They didn't know that the Facebook could be weaponized. They didn't know that Facebook could be used by white nationalists and used by you know, people in some invidious ways. But that's what's happened. And so we have to keep up with it. And keeping up with Jewish humor is also um, sometimes pretty challenging, don't you think? I think absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right that the potential for weaponization of any new technology, and very powerfully these, you know, is certainly the case. What it also has done, certainly in the case of Jewish comedy, is it's provided um, access points for new voices that were never able, let's say, to, um, to, to break through before. So uh, I think that's most powerfully illustrated in the case of women's voices, where there are a lot of young women comedians uh, who, who really were not uh, necessarily networked in, but someone like Rachel Bloom, a young woman named Rachel Bloom, who um, you know became a star because she uploaded her own videos to YouTube, uh, and you know she. I wasn't even familiar with her until I read your book, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, you know, and 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 now she has a television show on the on the CW, a regular network show. But it wouldn't have been the case until the network official said, "Oh, well, this young woman, ha you know, she's funny, but she also has you know millions of views on YouTube, so we know she has an audience, so we can take a chance on her." Um, or conversely, people saying uh, at Amazon, well, a show about a show like Transparent, we could never put this on a network, right? But we have our own models of, of what can be profitable or what can be important, and, and we can take a chance on something which can get a fraction uh, of the audience uh, and speak to a constituency uh, that is much more idiosyncratic. And overall, I think that is good for different voices in Jewish comedy, which, uh, you know, we have to remember, you know, is a minority voice. Uh, and so there are a lot of people, many of whom were Jews, of course, in the history of American culture, who said, you know, people, uh, this is going to be too small or too unimportant or too Jewish or too dangerous or too all these things in order to let it be on the airwaves or the radio waves. They said that about Seinfeld. They said about Seinfeld, yeah. exactly. Leslie, um, I think we've come to the time where we have some questions from the audience. So. Yeah. Thank you for your indulgence, Thank everybody. you guys yeah. so much for letting us uh, tell jokes. Now, I'm hoping this works. Can people hear this? Yeah? Okay, great. So we're going to ask some questions. Um, we're going to pass around cards. And you can continue um, your discussion as we wait for the cards to come in. But uh, I do have a few of my own that I'll just start you off with. So number one, when you talk about assimilation and... Uh, and you know, of course, the height of Jewish comedy in, in the mid-century. So the fact that Yiddish is not going to be as well known, certainly by our kids' uh, generation, their familiarity is not what it was, so that the instant humor of just using certain Yiddish words is not there, um, in certain of the comic archetypes, the, the historical um, connections are not there for the younger generation. So will this Jewish humor that we all treasure uh, fade away? What do you think? Jeremy? Uh, I think that the answer in some ways is of course. Uh, and I say this with great sadness. My last book that maybe some of you were here for was on Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem, when he died in, 19, uh, in 1916, you know, Hundreds of thousands of Jews mourned. 
100,000 people turned out in New York City for his funeral, right? If there is a, a percentage of that who today has read the work of Shalom Aleichem, one of the greatest Jewish comedians of history, right? I would be shocked. I would be delighted. Maybe some of them would buy my biography, but I would be shocked. Um, and I think that naturally some of this stuff will, will fade except for those people who really come to seek it out. What I do feel is that it will be replaced by another set of Jewish comedians and Jewish creative talents and Jewish, who will produce work that is speaking to its particular cultural movement more powerfully and profoundly than many of the work that, is, that has been done. Shalom Aleichem is a, is a remarkable uh, talent, and you know, his tevya uh, is one of the great comic creations of all time, but it is not surprising that most people who are familiar with it are familiar not with a century-old Yiddish literary incarnation, but with an uh, American great songbook musical that's half a century old. Uh, and that will con those interpretations and reinterpretations of classic tropes will continue for contemporary relevance. Yeah, I'm not optimistic about. Um, I, I like you know many of you know the Vea Hafta. I like to say teach Jewish humor diligently to your children. Uh, <laughs> and and the reality is I don't know how many people are doing that. Uh, I'm not saying that you're a cop out if you don't or that you have to or you should or feel guilty if you don't. But there really is you know more and more of this acculturation that's taken place that removes young people more and more as generations move along from uh, this taproot of Jewish humor that we've been talking about here that has so many different tributaries to it. Um, I'll tell you one thing that gives me hope though, and it's a joke. When, when, as Leslie mentioned, I've been with NPR for many years, and when my book came out, any of you listen to Weekend Edition, Scott Simon? Okay. Um, so Scott had me on, which was very nice. It was a good launch for the book on, on radio. and. Um, he said to me, I want you to tell what is my favorite joke, okay? And um, you'll know why this joke is his favorite joke when I tell it to you. It's a quick joke. Um, so a guy's walking in the 21st century, like the end of the 21st century or well into it, and he is, um, <laughs> yeah, wake him up, that's okay. Um, tw 21st century, and he's um, walking with his son, and somebody stops and says, your son, is so handsome, he's such a good looking boy. And father says, thank you, I appreciate that. He says, what's his name? He says, his name is Shlomo. And he says, Shlomo, he says, what kind of name is Shlomo? He says, well, he's named after his dead grandfather whose name was Scott. Now you have, <laughs> you know why Scott Simon wanted me to tell that joke, right? I mean, but, as he annotated it, it gives you that whole cyclicity of Jewish identity, you know, the assimilation, you give them names like Scott, and then maybe the next generation will want to retrieve some of that lost identity and will want to cleave to it or hold it dear as it should be and cherish it. Um, things do come back, and that's the hope that we have, that some of this will indeed come back. I know young people who are studying Yiddish, and it gives me some hope, but let me just tell you a quick story that's, that's probably very revealing. Um, when I first moved to San Francisco, it was in the early 70s, and I was asked by a rabbi if I wanted to teach a course at the local Jewish community center. And, it, and I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in Yiddish writers. San Francisco is such a yekka town. You know, it's German Jews, and they're very assimilated. They have Roman numerals after their name, you know. Uh, they celebrate Christmas and Easter. You know, there's not going to be any possibility of a, much of a turnout for this. He said, look, write up, you know, a sexy uh, description and maybe you'll get some people to come. I said, this is too challenging. But then I found some video stuff and I said, yids on vids and all kinds of, you know, chazerai like that. Okay. So I went into the classroom where I was teaching and there were more people, considerably more people than there are here tonight, you know. And I thought, this is incredible. What is this, a renaissance interest that I could not have detected or never could have been aware of? Somebody walks up to me and says, uh, Dr. Krasny, uh, excuse me, um, uh, you're in the wrong room here. Um, <laughs> the, um, the room across the hall is where you're going to be teaching. This, and this, remember, this is in the 70s. Dr. Mel Kranzler is in this room, and we got some confusion about the rooms. Dr. Mel Kranzler is doing a course on creative divorce. <laughs> and your course on Yiddish writers is a I didn't have a minion, you know. I mean, uh. I realized <laughs> that... People weren't exactly coming out to hear about Yiddish writers, and I'm afraid that when, when I hear uh, Jeremy talk about Mark, 
I almost said Mark Twain for Shalom Aleichem, but he was a Yiddish Mark Twain, right? Talk about people just not turning up. Uh, it's a reality that we're living with. So that, brings to, that brings up a question that we have from the audience here. Why was uh, Seinfeld so popular with the non-Jewish audience? What, what about that resonated to, to the broader community? Well, I, I'll, I'll tackle, I'll try to tackle that first. I think, first of all, because it was funny. Remember, it was written, most of it was written by and conceived by Larry David and, and, and Seinfeld, who were both really good comedians. Uh, Larry David, they used to call the comedian's comedian. He just couldn't last that long on stage because he'd get offended if somebody fell asleep. No offense. Um, or if somebody even talked or made a murmuring sound. It didn't matter. He would just get up and leave the stage. So I think they had good writers. And I think um, it was also there was something about it that captured you know, we were talking about Lenny Bruce before. Lenny Bruce said, if you're from New York, you're Jewish. You know, I don't care if you worship at St. Uh, Patrick's Cathedral, you're still Jewish because New York, there's something about just the energy in New York, the way that people live in New York and so forth that has a, a quintessential Jewish quality to it. And Seinfeld is really in many ways about New York. It's about living in New York. It's about young singles and it appealed to a younger audience. I think many of these things, but at first it was really de -Semiticized. And they went to great lengths to try to kind of play it down. You look at those early episodes, and then you have these later episodes with, you know, uh, the dentist who converted to Judaism so he could tell Jewish jokes, uh, <laughs> Elaine with Chick's appeal, you know, instead of sex appeal, Chick's appeal. You remember, there were all these episodes of the one with the moil, like I said. They were really, in some ways, pushing that envelope, but they'd already established a lot of their popularity. Right. No, I, I agree with all that. With Michael, it remind the the part of the success of Seinfeld, though, and this is the academic. It reminds me of a of a of a joke. It's an old joke from, again, the early twentieth century, where this Jewish guy, um, he is given he takes a job at a bus company, riding uh, driving the buses, and they say, look, we're going to start you out, um, and we're going to start you on the uh, you know on the Eighth Avenue line. It's not a very good line, but um, you know you'll get your feet wet. And, you know, so the first day he comes in, he gives a little bit of money. The second day he comes in, he gives a little money. The third day he comes in and his, you know, his bag is overflowing with cash. And they said, you know, what, what, how, how, what did you do? He said, well, you know, I was thinking there really is just, uh, you know, it really wasn't doing anything. So I turned it over and I brought the bus over to Broadway. And let me tell you, it is a gold mine over there. <laughs> and in some sense, you know, the biggest thing that happened with Seinfeld was for a while it was struggling, it was struggling, it was struggling. They put it on after Cheers. And it did very well in the ratings because people basically just kept watching. And this is important because it's not just because of the habits of television watchers, right? In fact, there was one episode of a sort of show within a show on Seinfeld where George and Jerry are pitching the show to NBC executives. And they say, the NBC executives say, well, why would someone watch a show about nothing? And, they, and George says, because it's on. To which the executive, played by Bob, Bob Albion, says, not yet. Right. Um, but the truth is that I think that other, the other things that Michael said uh, come into play because what Seinfeld did, and this is very important, was that it created its own audience. That is to say, it built the audience's tolerance for a lot of different kinds of comedy that had not been on the network air before then, including, in some ways, the representation of Jewish characters. As Michael had said before, really, uh, Jerry was, Jack Benny it was easy to not know that he was Jewish. And I think a lot of people did not. His writers think a lot of people did not. Jerry, because of his stand-up routine, he was portrayed as Jewish. And before Seinfeld, there were almost no Jewish characters on television for decades. Well, you almost. remember Molly Goldberg. Right, uh, there, there's the Goldbergs. Yeah. There's, there's Bernie, and Bridget Loves Bernie. But there are yeah. almost no other ones. Um, Bridget Loves Bernie, by the way, hold until, until, for, until Jackie Mason's show, Chicken Soup, that late lamented show, it holds the highest, those two hold the highest records, the shows for the highest ratings that were canceled. So listen, we have a question here. Jewish. One question says, whatever happened to Jackie Mason? You know, somebody asked me that this afternoon, and um, I answer? mean, he was such a hit on Broadway, and a lot of his humor, when you really think about it, is uh, one of the theses in my book is a lot of Jewish humor is based on we're different. Uh, yeah. We're distinctive, we're individual, we're separate and distinct. I mean, he'd say, and some of the stuff was really whoops, um, stereotypical in ways that were, I suppose, could be disturbing to some people. He'd get up there and he'd, with that voice, he says, I, want, I don't know if I'd like to try to imitate it, but you know, I know a guy, he's half Jewish, he's half Polish, 
He's a custodian, but he owns the building. You know, he uses these kind of stereotypes. I know a guy, he's half Italian, he's half Jewish, can't get it wholesale, he steals it. You know? And people would laugh, but the jokes would be somewhat chauvinistic when you really decoded them. He was saying, you know, we're better, we're chosen, we're in some ways superior. And it resonated greatly for Jewish audiences, but it also captured a lot of Gentiles who just loved that shtick and that voice of his and much of the humor that he relied upon. I mean, when, when you think about what he was doing, a lot of it was just stereotypical. Yeah. Gentiles like to eat, Jews, I mean, Gentiles like to drink, Jews like to eat. You know, that was really typical, almost quintessential Jackie Mason humor. So, Jeremy, what, that kind of thing, do you think that, uh, we have a question here, could non-Jews get away with using some of the humor that Jews do? And related to that, when you mentioned people being uncomfortable with Curb Your Enthusiasm and characters like that, also I think of Woody Allen, the nebbish, uh, the womanizer, you know, always going after the, in film and in, it turns out in real life, of course, <laughs> going after, you know, the, the woman inappropriately uh, too young for him. Um, do we worry that, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's okay for when Jews do that to represent Jews that way? Maybe yes, maybe no. But if non-Jews did it, it would be completely outrageous, right? I mean, this is something, Michael, you were already talking about, I think, within the, we were talking about within the conversation. I mean, I think that, you know, increasingly, um, the norms of comedy are changing, are changing now. We're in a conversation about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate for comedy. And I think one of those, uh, those, those things that is really coming to the fore is authenticity, whatever that may mean, right? Nobody knows exactly what that word means. But whatever it means is someone is licensed or allowed or authentically to speak for a particular group and other people are not. This almost always falls apart if you look at it too closely. Uh, just I'll give you one example. Almost all of the comedy uh, on television now is not written by any individual person, even if it says it is written by person X, but it's written and workshopped in a writer's room with 13 or 14 people sitting around a table. I can guarantee you that any given joke, even if it is spoken or written by a, or by a Jewish person, is being workshopped by all of these people who are all pitching jokes in this kind of way. Um, is that okay? Is that not okay? Are people only allowed to pitch jokes for a character that's theirs? That's just not how it works, and it's not how it's ever going to work in current you know, entertainment. So the answer to, to, to this is I think that intent matters a lot more than identity. Uh, that, that, is, that is sort of the position. I think when people are making these jokes and they're making them cruelly, I think we judge them in a very different way than if they're making them um, to, to try and, you know, with, with a certain generosity uh, of spirit, even if the jokes themselves are not very nice. I think that's very wise and sensibly said. I think a lot of it has to do with motive. Uh, if it's malignant or if it's at all, you know, toxic, um, Take heed and, and call the person out. That's uh, what I strongly believe in. And uh, you have to make these judgments for yourselves. I mean, let's face it, we have a lot of Lancelite who are very overly sensitive, and they think that you know, any joke about Jews is uh, somehow misguided and anti-Semitic, and that's simply not true. But most of us have a pretty good detector, I like to think. Now, Jeremy, in your book, you, you identify seven strands of Jewish comedy. So I'd like to ask you both one question, beginning with Jeremy. First, you can maybe say a little bit about the seven strands that you go into in the book. But then, um, as you both worked on this subject, did you come up with, in your own mind, a definition of what is Jewish humor? Is it different from non-Jewish humor? Did, did, did some definition crystallize in your mind? But also tell us about the seven strands. I did come up um, with a definition of Jewish humor, it and it can be yours for only $28, <laughs> right over there, immediately after we're done. Um, no, I, look, I think that the, uh, you know, the, one of the things that the book tried to say was that almost any definition of Jewish humor that can be expressed in the formula Jewish comedy or Jewish humor is, is going to be insufficient. Because... I could say whatever it is, and you could say, well, how about this? And you could come up with a great joke or a great creative force or a great story that would not fit into that definition whatsoever. And I thought that was right. But I did say, you know, when you come, when you take a look at kind of all of the Jewish funny stuff over the years, it kind of falls into these seven different categories. And I'm not going to waste your time by going into each of those categories, because I know you're going to all buy the book, so it's all going to be fine. You'll find it out there. <laughs> well, Michael, what do you... 
<laughs> well, I agree entirely with the word insufficient because it's such a wide canvas, uh, I found. I found certain themes that resonated for me that I wound up focusing on. But the reality is it's such a range and such a diversity. Uh, I take that on early on, just you know, talking. I mean, how do you, you, you talk about some of the most famous Jews who came from Jewish backgrounds or have Jewish DNA, um, how do you link them together? You don't. You simply can't, and you don't. But there are motifs, and there are light motifs, and there are things that really bind them. I, I think a lot of this humor has to do, though, with what I, what I pretty much already alluded to, loss, and a sense of distinctiveness, difference, separateness. Um, you really find that in a lot of the humor, but what it always has vexed me in many ways is how similar the humor can be, again, in other cultures. You know, um, there's that old joke, what is Jewish Alzheimer's? Right, the answer is you forget everything but the grudges. But you know, <laughs> suddenly I heard that about Sicilians. I heard it about Irish. I heard it about Arabs. You know, I mean, it just follows. Uh, in so and then I had a little epiphany in writing this book because um, a writer, uh, you can sometimes get accused of dropping names, but you know, one of my students said, you got names to drop, you should drop them. Um, there's a writer named Amy Tan, whom some of you may know happens to be a Chinese-American writer, Joy Luck Club, and also happens to be a friend. So she invites me and my wife over to have dinner at her house with her husband, and she says, I've got the greatest joke for you, because she knows I'm a joke aficionado. And it, let me tell you the joke, but then let me tell you the denouement of her telling me this joke. So the joke is that a guy opens a new barbershop, someone comes in, gets a haircut, who's a priest. And the priest goes to get his wallet. The barber says, no, you're a man of God. I don't take money from clerics. Please consider it. This is your first haircut for me. Consider it on the house. And the, pre and, the, and the barber goes out the next morning, and he sees a beautiful crucifix there as a gift. Thank you for the free haircut. The priest leaves it there. And then a minister goes in, and the same exact thing transpires. He gives him a haircut, and the minister says, no, I don't take money from you. You're a clergyman. Goes out the next morning, there's a beautiful Bible inscribed by the clergyman. Rabbi comes in, he gives a rabbi a haircut, the next day he goes out, there are 12 rabbis there. Okay, now what do you do with a joke like that? So, all right. Now, <laughs> all right. I mean, we laugh, right? We laugh, and, and the laughter, agree, laughter can release some anxiety, it can release all kinds of emotions. But here's the, the denouement to that story. Amy Tan tells me that story, but it's of a German, a Frenchman, and a Chinese guy. And the Chinese guy is there with 12 other Chinese guys. So you see how these things translate. I mean, there's the old joke about when, when do Jews officially complete, uh, when, when is, uh, sorry, screwed up this joke already, when does life officially begin for Jewish people? And the answer is, of course, after medical school. And that's the old joke. You know, <laughs> the fetus is not anything until after the fetus becomes an MD or has an MD after his or her name, particularly his name. Amy Tan told me, he said the same joke about Chinese, you know, it's the same, I mean, it crosses over, and a lot of these are really fascinating the way they do cross over. They become multicultural in the best sense of that word. So Jeremy, here's a question for you. Someone asks, uh, you mentioned a lot about the humor in the Book of Esther. Could you please talk about that? Sure. Um, one of the things that I, that I suggest uh, in the book is that all of these seven strands, as I call them, of Jewish comedy, the idea, all of the ideas are built into the book of Esther because, and I'll just say this very briefly, the, the, the biblical humor before the book of Esther in the, uh, is a kind of triumphalist humor. God is in his house. God is watching over the Jews. All is right with the world. The Jewish power is expanding. It's getting better and better. Um, we are doing great. And then comes the destruction of the temple and the beginning of the diaspora. And the Esther, although it is in the Bible, right, is, one, is the first great book of Jewish diaspora. Uh, it's about how you live as a minority surrounded by people who want to kill you. Right? And it is not coincidental that that book has in it comedy, that it is the basis for not only it is read on the Jewish holiday of Purim, right, the holiday of merriment, right, if there's any truth to that, they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat and rejoice, right? That's, that's <laughs> Esther, right? And it's also that it's a very black comedy because as many of you know, the book of Esther is one of the few places in the Bible where God's name is not mentioned. So on the one hand, we can believe, and certainly the great rabbinical tradition 
tries to accentuate this anxiously, that all of the things that save the Jews in the book of Esther are because God is watching. God is planning everything. He has made it so that Esther is in the right place at the right time and Mordechai is in the right place at the right time. It's all, uh, there's a divine author to all of this. And maybe that's so. But it's also worth pointing out that that is not present in the text and that the great metaphor of the book of Esther, the one that Purim is named after, is the lottery, is chance. Maybe it's just chance. Maybe it's God helping us. Maybe we are the chosen people. Maybe we are the, maybe we're not. Or maybe she saves her own people because she marries a Shagetz. That could I mean, be. that occurred to me pretty early on when I first but, read the book of right. Esther. And I, could, I think that it is a book about sort of, you know, culture. But of course, she doesn't marry him. He chooses her right. out of all of these people. Now, either that is divine will or she is just, co it's coincidence. We don't know. And th there's that kind of thing. That the great salvation of Jewish history may just be a black joke. And that is that kind of unease and anxiety. That's why I think Esther is so important, because it sets the tone for a lot of Jewish history coming forward. Now we have a question that says, what do you think of the website, Jews Telling Jokes? Does that help to preserve Jewish humor? Or are there other sources of new Jewish humor that we should anticipate or check in? I love that website when it first came out, and then they monetized it, and <laughs> everything changed. Um, in fact, I was thinking once I could have done Broadway, and I could have called it an old Jew telling jokes um, instead of old Jews telling jokes. But it was a wonderful idea. I know the guy who started it. He capitalized on it. He made himself a fortune, not only there, but in a few other uh, things. And it's... Uh, it's a pretty good story for the most part, but when Jeremy was talking before about what's down the line here, I don't think we know. We can't see necessarily with a periscope around the bend in terms of what, there's some very inventive and, and tremendously talented young Jewish kids who are out there trying to make people laugh. It's part of their tradition, it's part of their heritage, and they're gonna find ways to do it. The wonderful thing is now we have all these other ethnic forms of humor that have come about, and we have, you know, with a much freer and open society, we have a lot of gay and lesbian humor. We have just different identity humor, transgender's humor, and so forth. African American. It's really pluralistic. So, so does it depend? Do you think humor is helped by being uh, a minority and, and feeling other, feeling somewhat excluded, and that kind of... Uh, of course do it you has. think that's uh, essential? <laughs> I, think that, I think that's right. a given. Because who have been the greatest humorists right up to date, pretty much, in terms of American humor? It's been African Americans and Jews. I mean, in terms of stand-up, in terms of... You have to include Cosby in that, too, I'm sorry to say. But, yeah. I, yeah, I agree with that entirely. I mean, I have to say that, you know, one of the things, that alienation is, can, can also be a state of mind. Uh, that is to say that, you know, some great comedians, uh, you know, they are from a majority culture, right, but they somehow feel different. But it helps to be structurally alienated. It helps to be someone whose culture is saying, um, I want, I am separate, and yet, and this is the case, I think, with Jews in a way that was different from African Americans, although they're both these alienated men, right? The possibilities of a full embrace, not only of, but by the culture, were possible for Jews in, a, in America in a way that they weren't for African Americans. It was possible that that country club joke that we were, those country club jokes that we were telling could never work in African American comedy in the 1950s. It just was structurally impossible. And so that led to not only a certain kind of comedy about the possibilities of rejection, but also to the kind of great wholehearted embrace of American culture that maybe, just maybe you could be a part of, that led people like Mel Brooks to watch all these universal horror movies and these westerns and these things like that, and then make all these brilliant parodies of them. Yeah. Right, that was part of it too. You know the other brilliant country club joke about the, the wealthy couple who want to get into this exclusive Gentile co country club and of course they're Jewish and they're excluded and they can't get in and finally he donates a lot of money to the capital fund and they let them in and Mrs. Lefkowitz goes to this event which is welcoming new members and also all the traditional members are there, the members who've been there for years. And she goes in and she's dressed, she's always wanted to do this, she's got a beautiful mink stole and she's got all this jewelry and everything and she goes in and she sees all these wasps who are totally understated and not dressed to the nines like she is and you know, she can't help herself. She goes, oi, gewalt, and then she goes, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> it's where we, we come back to where we started, the Yiddish. It's always the Yiddish that comes out, which I'm delighted about. You know. I know you, I have to say one funny thing. 
You know, recently I tried to get my daughter to uh, respond to a text message, and I found myself when she wasn't answering, I just went, you who, Mrs. Goldberg? <laughs> Finally, so she writes me back and she goes, who's Mrs. Goldberg? <laughs> so I really feel like we've lost a lot as the, as the millennials and, and their kids will not appreciate what so much of us had uh, growing up. And um, so I hope that uh, it does continue. I want to thank you both so very, very much. Thank for you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Discussion. Really fun. We hope that you will uh, come out and take some jokes home. The authors will be signing books, and uh, the reception will continue in the lobby.